Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Hunt. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs here at MOCA. Uh, we are thrilled to have artist Analia Saban joining us in the context of Ana Maria Maialino's exhibition. Uh, this is the first in our public program series for the fall um, and for Ana Maria Maialino's exhibition. Uh, and this is part of a larger programmatic series that we have here at MOCA called Artist on Artists, in which artists reflect on other artists' practices in the context of an exhibition or in the context of reading one work in particular. So what we'll do here today is just take a little walk through the exhibition and Analia will speak to some themes that touch her own practice, uh, certainly, but you know, things in our many walks already that you've been connected to and wanted to spend more time with, we'll get to do all together here today. Um, before we get into the meaty stuff, I just want to tell you a bit about Analia, her practice, um, and some of her incredible accolades uh, in her career. First, she amazingly currently has two exhibitions at Spruth Magers, the one gallery in Berlin, the other here in Los Angeles. It's open until August 19th, so you should make your way over to Wilshire to see more of Analia's work. Uh, but before that, <laughs> she was born in Buenos Aires and has been living and making work in Los Angeles for over a decade. Um, her work uses traditional materials in unconventional ways. Uh, more recent work uh, has been paintings woven by hand and manipulated through a loom actually in, in a way that textiles are. So there's often a conflation of the traditional uh, used in non-traditional ways. Um, but the work varies from painting, photography, textile, wood and ink, uh, many things that you'll see in these galleries today, including the concrete forms, which is something newer in Analia's practice that Ana Maria Maialino has been working uh, in the form of for years. Uh, uh, in terms of exhibitions, Analia has shown her work in Los Angeles at LACMA, uh, at the Hammer Museum as part of the first Made in LA in 2012. And internationally, uh, her work has been shown at Palais de Tokyo in Paris, the Marco Museum of Contemporary Art Vigo, and the Centre d'Art Contemporain in Switzerland. I could go on, but I would rather introduce our esteemed guest, Analia Saban. Please join me in welcoming her. So thank you so much, Amanda, uh, for thinking of me for this. And thank you to Brian Barsen and Helen Molesworth for curating such a great exhibition. Uh, I think Pacific Standard Time will be quite a lesson for all of us to learn a lot about Latin American art. Uh, so far, what I've seen has been very interesting. And, and, and re really, for me, uh, coming from Argentina, that's where I was born uh, in 1980 in Buenos Aires, it's, it, it, I also have a lot of catching up to do. So I'm looking forward to the fall. Um, I love the show, and I say that sincerely. I mean, there are many connections. Uh, at the end of it, I told Amanda, I feel like I spent some time with my mother. <laughs> I mean, but not really my mother, uh, because my mother is not such a caring mother, but like a mother. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and, 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 and maybe like what we desire a mother to be and what we kind of fear a mother to be, you know, like these two topics, I think are very present in her work. Um, so Ana Maria is a product of immigration, like many of us living in, in America, in all the Americas. Um, we kind of have a connection too because she's born in Italy and I come from Italian grandparents. Uh, and she was immigrating many times during her life and having quite a hard time because of it. So she was born in 42 in Escalea, Italy. And by uh, 54, so her mom was from Ecuador, her father was Italian, and then in 54, so she was 12, they moved to Venezuela, and then in 1960, they moved to Rio de Janeiro. So she was eight, 18 when she moved, and she started going to art school and doing quite well, but then in 64, the dictatorship started. So imagine like being born in the war in Italy and escaping Italy because of it, it's very poor. Uh, she comes from a very big family, she's the youngest of nine children, so the idea of feeding the family 
actually is very important in the work and sharing the food that was quite limited. It's quite traumatizing for her. And um, then, you know, trying to look for a better place. So going to come into America, going to Venezuela first. And I guess that didn't work out so well because quite quickly they moved to Rio de Janeiro. And then once you start kind of settling in, then like four years later, the dictatorship begins. And then you are again pressed by another political government in trouble. So um, then she takes a break and they go to uh, New York at some point in the late 60s and then they come back to Brazil and that's where uh, she's still there now living in Sao Paulo. So it's quite a journey and I think you see a lot of that journey in the work. Um, but we can begin talking about a few works in this room if you follow us. So there are many works, so I will keep it quite short because it's quite a big exhibition, but uh, you can see it. Um, but I think this is a very important wall here. Uh, it talks a little bit, they are very early works, and it talks a little bit about her idea of uh, a human. <laughs> so basically, as you can see here, I mean, I, these are works that I'm thinking about so much, uh, just you know, daily basis of eating and swallowing and digesting and then going, number one and two. So um, there's like two words. So you have the word of like feeding yourself and then this constant cycle of digesting food and, and so on. Um, I was thinking this morning like, <laughs> What if like, you let go of your face and all you have left is the mouth? So if you really like, shut your eyes and like, you shut your nose, I mean, you can still kind of function because you can still breathe, you can still eat, and you don't even need a tongue because you could basically swallow all the time. And I'm mentioning that because there is a piece about even like, getting rid of the tongue that's later uh, in the show. So you can basically exist. And I feel like at the very basic level, but of course a very sad existence because you don't have eyes, you don't have taste, you don't have anything, you only have teeth and that lets you like chew so you can like then go through that digestive system that as you can see it's very basic <laughs> and she's missing the gallbladder which I thought was kind of fun to like as a small detail but quite interesting because um, like humans don't need it so you can like you can actually be without it um, and of course like we can assume that there are lungs in there, but I mean, she's not, she doesn't even care about that. I mean, it's just a very basic, very aggressive, like there is the top, we eat, we swallow, and then there is the bottom. Of course, you have the, the heaven and earth. You have the, the heavens and, and then the, more like the, the dark, you know, hole or, you know, that type of uh, dichotomy and then same in these words. So I think that was quite interesting. And also the use of the grid as a support system. I mean, this is interesting because I, I have a work up now that deals with the same thing. I mean, this idea that the grid has become such a symbol in, 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 in art and you see it from, you know, the Renaissance times where, where you know, um, it, they were using the grid to like, you know, copy or to like, you know, use it as like this kind of high art uh, drawing vocabulary. But then it's also in this case, or you can see the grid also like in minimalism or, you know, in Sol LeWitt, Agnes Martin and so on. But then here in this case is the tiles of the bathroom. And if you go to the Mocha bathroom, it's exactly the same. Like you're like, you find in this container of like tiles and it's a very kind of high uh, vocabulary of the grid but it's also like the low tiles in the bathroom which I think it's interesting. And then something also important is I feel like the imprisonment inside the body so there is also an inside and outside and there is also kind of this hope to escape. I mean I kind of see that could be also due to maybe politics um, but there is always like you know, we're here and then we try to escape somehow. Um, something interesting that I was talking to a friend once and she was saying like, she was saying something that made me think of this. She said, isn't it interesting how, you know, when someone goes to jail, the body is in jail, but then when that person dies, the body is returned to the family. I don't know, it's just a thought, but like the idea that, you know, you're not in incarcerating, you're not in incarcerating 
the body, you're actually incarcerating the inside of the body, whatever that is, be the soul or whatever. So I just feel like there is always this inside and outside obsession um, defined either by the mouth or the skin or like the limitations of the country, the limitations of borders, and that's very recurrent um, in her work. And then here on the right, it's also important um, the fact of, you know, whether, where does she come from? So she comes from, as you can see, almost the crossing or the family of nine. So she's number nine. And it's really like a math or a formula. And I mean, there is also like, so who am I, right? I mean, if I'm like part of like such a huge family, and I feel like it's so nice because she added a bow to her head, kind of trying to say, okay, like, this is me, you know, like, and maybe that's like the only difference between, you know, all these numbers and like this type of like, you know, who are we? Like, we are like part of this huge system and maybe like, you know, I can distinguish myself by putting something on my hair. I mean, and I just think it's so subtle, but so beautiful. Um, there is a small piece on the wall uh, somewhere which is a grid that says EU and you can see it all over and it's basically the I, uh, like I mean me, so EU in, in uh, Portuguese and it's interesting because when it turns around, so if it's like it's upside down and it's on the borders, you can see it in the back wall, it starts becoming NO because of the spelling e -U turns around becomes N-O or N-A, like the spelling for the, Brazil, the Portuguese no, it's noun, so N-A-O. So it becomes like this no, and it's all in this like I, this me that it's caught in this grid and it's going upside down and trying to escape, but it's still very contained. And then the last piece in this, um, in this room is that map of Italy, which is burning and it's from, she, she calls it Italy in 1942. And I think it's quite interesting because she could have chosen another year because the war was there in 1943 and it was there in 1944, but she chose her birth year as the map of the burning country, which I think it's kind of symbolic and really nice. So we can move on. I think this is quite an interesting room and it's the room of maybe a substance, I call it, because you have the eggs, of course the egg as a symbol of fertility and food and so on. Pasta, the Italian pasta is a super important symbol in her work as a very basic in ingredient that can feed you know, a lot of people. Um, the sculpture with the rice and the beans behind you, I think as a sculpture, to be honest, I'm not a huge fond of it, but as a performance, I think it's very important. The fact that they were basically throwing rice in like carnival and it was basically confetti. Um, this happened in Argentina too. Basically when someone has a graduation, people start throwing flour and eggs and it's kind of like symbolic. But then lately finally said, well, enough of that because it's food and we can't do this anymore, even though it was going on for decades. Uh, so there is a photograph in the catalog that you can see where she's actually embracing that sculpture, so I think it, ha it comes more, more from her performance of holding on to the rice and holding on to the beans and saying like, you know, you're not going to take this to start throwing on the streets. It's just not going to be like that anymore. Um, coming from also immigrant grandparents in my family, with, even though in my case we grew up, you know, okay, like middle class, I mean, like there was always food on the table, but for the grandparents was always really, really offensive to leave food on the table, even though you are super full. So I think we come in a way from that type of immigration, um, you know, holding on to the to the basics. Uh, this piece, I think it's interesting and it's a piece to look at and really uh, it's so uncomfortable to look at so I thought we can spend a minute to really connect with the image itself of the sharpness on the nose and the tongue and the cutting. I mean, it really feel like you can't even see it because uh, it starts hurting. Um, but it really connects with dictatorship. And something I want to mention, so 
you know, the dictatorship in Latin America started to slow down in 1980, and that's when I was born. So to be honest, it didn't affect me in any way, other than the fact that when I was growing up, there was nothing left in, case, in terms of art. All the art was completely wiped out. There was no money for any museums left. There was no culture left. All the artists were in exile because they had either disappeared. I mean, they were, I mean, many people were, you know, death just because of their ideas, or so they had to escape and live in Europe and other places in order to protect their practice and their lives. So when I was growing up, even though I wasn't in touch with all this history because people were trying to move on, uh, it was still strange that there was no art, artist reference of any kind. It was just gone. And, you know, for me to become an artist, was it wouldn't even cross my mind because to go to the museum was a very depressing experience where like the museum had no money for, you know, to paint the walls and, and to fix the ceiling or something. So um, it's just interesting to think about her life and to realize, you know, what an artist goes through sometimes and to kind of face the fact that it's very hard to an art, for an artist to make art when the political situation goes really, really bad. And, you know, I was just thinking about this this week. I'm like, you know, you need like, it's kind of a harsh reality to think about because you think, oh, artists, you know, we can, we're invinci invinci invincible and like even in acts in times of war, you can maybe like bring out more of yourself and your emotions. But someone, another artist from Argentina, David Lamelas, who will also have, be a big part of Pacific Standard Time, he told me, you know, artists, they need some type of order, otherwise it's very hard to think about things. And, and, and I kind of tend to agree now that I'm making art and doing these things. And, and if I think of you know, making art this week in Virginia, I would probably wouldn't be able to even think because I'm so like, you know, uh, troubled by the situation. So I think it's, it's just something to think about, I mean, especially these days. And I think in, when you look at her work, I mean, especially like this piece, Hero, and you know, who are the war heroes? I mean, in this case, she's really talking about military who is going against art, uh, I mean, culture and artists and thinkers of any kind. I mean, it's, like really against like the freedom, the basic freedoms of humanity, um, that's like the symbol. So it's, it's very clear. And then in this case, it's really about the silencing. So you can exist, but if you don't have a tongue, like that's it, you're like silent. And then if you don't have a nose, you won't enjoy anything because you don't have it. So you can still function, but it's, it's gone basically. So I think that's something that's really, important and recurrent in her work. Uh, we can go to the next room. So this, I think it's a very important room and uh, by reading one of the catalogs, I realized that this, this type of performance was what uh, brought the attention of Helen Molesworth to produce the show. Uh, basically, she did a performance, uh, she did I'm sorry, not performance, uh, the work itself. So she did this installation in um, castle in the previous documenta in 2012 and basically she had a house and everything in the house meaning like uh, tables, beds, any type of counter space, any, everything was covered with this type of pasta shapes. So it's really like this place of cooking and producing uh, the molding of the clay with the hands. I mean like she really thinks that bodies are, are, are are basically to mold something, so either by hand or with your intestines. I don't know if you know, but like a, son, a sign of constipation is when you, when you know, it comes out with the curls of the intestines. So that's the sculpture in a way that you produce, and it's really molded by the intestine itself. So this is something that I think, in the, maybe not in such a literal way, but she's very interested in, and I so. She talks, Helen, in, in the essay, she talks a lot about walking into this, the house and smelling the clay and seeing kind of this live organism in the space. And it was all produced here at MOCA. And basically, this was all by hand. It's like a thumbprint of each person. So very quickly making a thumbprint on the clay and pushing it against this chicken wire. 
And it's basically, I mean, I think a map of nothing but everything, you know, so it's really like this type of very, very basic feeling of I exist, I have a thumb, I have a mouth, and this is my, this is me. <laughs> and it's just like in this type of, you know, geological or geographical uh, constellation of people. And then all the pieces on the, on the table, of course, you know, resemble cooking and pasta shapes. And it's really, I mean, this is, I feel like, when the mother really comes into play because it's really about sitting around the kitchen counter and, and making pasta together, which I think it's a very beautiful symbol that no matter what's going on, you can still go back to that and feed the family. So it's very touching. So please watch your step as we move on. I think this is a nice continuation from the other room, thinking about, again, thinking about molds and something that, you know, I think it's very powerful, of course. I mean, it's the idea of the womb, um, the fact that we all come from a womb. And then in this case, she leaves, I mean, kind of the, the pieces with the, this is pieces of clay that are kind of encapsulated by concrete. So in this case, the pieces of clay are still in it. And then behind you, you see the, empty, the emptiness, basically. And I think it's quite um, important. I mean, this is where I think a lot about this philosopher, uh, Julia Kristeva, and an essay that was very influential to me on the abject. I mean, the idea that, you know, we are almost abjected. So the abject is basically the, pos the opposite of the object. So it's the kind of not anti-object, but like the empty non-object. And it's really like we're kind of almost like I don't know, expelled from the body, so it's quite traumatizing in a way, as an excrement, you know, there is this kind of similarity, and, and she talks a lot about that. It's a very dark essay that makes you very depressed, but I think it's something to, in a way, once you go there and you go really deep and like in the very dark, then you can also appreciate like the good parts of like the object that, you know, you are incarnated and you do exist and you, you can breathe and you do have, you know, eyes and noses and all that. So I think it's, it's quite an important uh, essay for me where I really connect that, like the empty womb. I mean, I do remember having a child and, you know, in a way I was very happy for my baby, but then I cried for a week because there was this emptiness and I was, fa I was shredding my, my, you know, whatever was left from the, the holding of that baby inside me and it's quite kind of, you're bleeding a lot and you're like dealing with a lot of death at the same time that you're happy because you have this happy baby birth. So I think it's something very important in her work. Um, she is a mother. Um, there is that piece about her mother and her daughter, uh, all connected by a thread that of course looks like a spaghetti in a way, and they are connected. And the idea that there is a womb inside a womb. I mean, I am very personal too, but I remember being 20 weeks pregnant and then seeing the fact that like the baby already had her eggs inside her and thinking wow like this is like half of my um, half of my you know grandchildren are already inside my baby who's not even born yet you know so it's just like this kind of thinking about the womb and where we come from and the shape within the shape and the mold and the body that shape us I think it's very important and very recurrent and then and then all these pieces that come from really the hand and the folding. And, and I think this is a much later period than the, than, the early, than the early pieces. And I think it's a little bit more of a positive period. I mean, this is like, you know, in terms of politics, things are coming back in Brazil. You know, life is much better than it was like in the 70s. Uh, and there is more of a construction going on. And she always talks about this. She's like, she talks about the construction of the self. And whenever she refers about her biography, she talks about what 
constructed me. I don't know if it's a translation from the Portuguese or what, but she, I think it's very interesting that she talks about the self as a construction. And I see something about constructing in the clay and in the making and this like type of trying to hold things together by these very basic materials, which are basically sand as in concrete and in clay and so on. So I think it's an, an in flower too. So I think it's very important, this type of very, very basic materials that she tries to keep together. Um, so that's my thinking. And we can go to the last room. So this is the last room in the show. Um, drawing is always important in her practice. Um, I wait for everyone to come in. I think it's a very basic vocabulary of lines and points. I mean, very, very important that connects with her stitching, which I, you know, maybe I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but I really feel like this idea of piecing back together and stitching things together is very important for her. I mean, I think it's a way of being in control when the situation is not so easy to control. Um, and then the alphabet on the wall, um, I think that's the title she refers to. Uh, it's a much newer piece from 2003. And it's very interesting because I couldn't find much literature on it. And I came thinking like, oh, I don't know because you know I didn't have enough context. But then it's quite interesting to just stand and look at it very carefully because this type of letters or alphabet or vocabulary for you know that references all her, her other work i mean basically they are like very basic pieces of ink on cardboard and i think the way she's handling the paint or the ink uh, she's really letting it drip and you know kind of do its thing in a way so very organically uh, making those drawings and i think it's really um, the more you look at it, the more you start seeing things. And then, and then in the end, it's endless vocabulary, endless shapes. I mean, you start seeing from faces to legs to wishing bones and so many things. So I think uh, I, mean, I see a mustache now and you know, letters and noses. Uh, so I think it's, it's really kind of a more playful piece. I don't see it as deep as maybe the other pieces. I really think this is like more I mean, my thinking on the later work is that it's a much more, uh, it's a lighter work in a way. I mean, it's a work where she's, she's allowing herself to be a bit more playful and she's suffering a bit less. And, and I think it's a work that, you know, is just more whimsical and, and speaking more for itself. Um, but we have some time if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm interested in when you heard about the work. I'm amongst a lot of um, artists right now, we're talking about the fact that we miss this body of work entirely when we were being educated in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to get a all these other people who have their dialogue. And um, I guess I'm kind of interested in when you approach this work. I mean, I'll be very honest. I know the work because they asked me to do the talk. And I'm ignorant and I'm ashamed of it, I really am. But it's really because I decided to become an artist in the US, so my education was here. And when I was 19, I came to study film. And then like, the idea of art would never even occur to me in Buenos Aires growing up, because as I said, there was nothing left, like no art references. You know, when you grow up here, you have, like you said, like hundreds of heroes, I mean, on a mass, me mass art type of consumption, you can look at Warhol, but then you can look at, you know, people like Eva Hess. I mean, like you have so many people to reference your practice or who you are. But when I was growing up there, really the only culture that survived the dictatorship was music because it's invisible and harder to control, literature because books are easier to hide, and theater because it's also like the spoken word. Uh, everything else was completely gone, like including the artists who are all in exile and they they are starting to come back, like let's say, I would say in the last 15 years. So ever since I left, uh, a major museum opened in Buenos Aires, all the culture now gets 
funding, not like crazy funding, but any normal funding that any government can afford, but they get equal funding, like a theater would get funding. You know, like there is funding for the arts and, and the artists are coming back because they were really not by choice gone. You know, they were gone by force. So, and now even I was reconnecting to, you know, artists and like understanding the history. So it's, it's really, it's so interesting how they get the Getty doing this. To be honest, at the beginning, I was very skeptical of Pacific Standard Time because I said, like, how do you define Latin America? I mean, it's impossible. It's like saying that the US and Canada are like the same thing, even though <laughs> they're completely different. You know what I mean? So how, how do you label, like, LA in LA? I felt it could, ha it could come out as totally, like, you know, um, generalized and stereotypical. And I was very skeptical. But now that I start seeing the independent shows, I realized that, well, first of all, it's done the proper way because we get to focus on a specific artist or very focused shows that do teach us like very different things, but, you know, very basic difference between, between Brazil and Argentina or Argentina and Uruguay or Uruguay and, you know, Ecuador, whatever, you know, so you, you do see that type of focus. And then, and then we get to learn and we get to draw the parallelism between Eva Hess and Maiolino, or uh, Leandro Katz, a conceptual artist, and Valdes, you know, from Argentina, and John Baldessari, or we get to see Marta Minujin's uh, Partenon of Books at Documenta, which is one of the most important works for Argentina ever, and this is one work that I did get to see when I was six years old, and it's like the only work that I had as a reference growing up, and now I see it as part of Documenta, and it's like, wow, like, Finally, but you know, all these things were happening, they were just hiding or they were displaced, and now uh, it's really important. And then something interesting too, just talking to Andrew Parchuk from the Getty, uh, who's one of the main uh, brains behind PST, is the fact that, you know, everyone was a bit skeptical, like why Latin America now? You know, why not in five years or, you know, and then all of a sudden it becomes the most important show because of Trump and Mexico and so on. So it's really like uh, interesting how the time is perfect and, and we're all, as I said, we're all getting an education, including myself, and I, I, I have a lot to catch up. It's a good question, though. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, most of all, to Analia. Uh, and to the point of your question, we will be doing so many more performances, uh, re-performances of Anna Maria's work uh, throughout September and October, as well as other lectures uh, and conversations to kind of give a fuller picture of her practice, but also the context of PST LA LA, um, and so many of the artists who we're all uh, learning about uh, today and beyond. So thank you. Please join us again on September 16th. Until then, enjoy your Sunday. <laughs>